Hello, and welcome to MedTable Talk. This is the last of three episodes where we'll discuss creating patient-centered approaches to optimal care, best practices for utilizing BCMA-directed therapy. I am your host, Melody Smith. I'm a physician scientist at Stanford University in the Division of Bone Marrow Transplant and Cell Therapy. I'm happy to be joined by my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Rodriguez Otero and Dr. Adrian Phillips. Dr. Rodriguez Otero, could you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Paula Rodriguez Otero. I am a hematologist working at the University of Navarra in Pamplona, Spain. And Dr. Phillips? I'm Adrian Phillips. I'm an associate professor at Weill Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian Hospital in the Division of Cellular Therapy and Stem Cell Transplant. So in today's episode, we're going to be discussing biomarker identification for prognosis and treatment selection for patients with relaxed refractory multiple myeloma, optimal treatment decision-making, approaches to address health disparities in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, and strategies to engage patients in shared decision-making, improved patient outcomes, and advocate for access to care. Remember, this is the final episode of the series, so if you haven't already, check out episodes one and two to learn about the evolving treatment landscape using BCMA therapy for relapse refractory multiple myeloma. Picking up where we left off from episode two, we had a great discussion in terms of various BCMA targets um, using antibody drug conjugates, bispecific therapies, as well as chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. So Adrian, you know, regarding treatment sequencing, where do the BCMA therapies in your perspective fall in the lineup of therapies that are potentially available for patients with relapse refractory multiple myeloma? Thanks, Melody. So the International Myeloma Working Group has recommendations for the treatment of patients with relapse refractory multiple myeloma, and the preferred options are really any first relapse options that haven't been tried. And as someone who treats a lot of lymphoma, this is where I feel like there's a gap in in knowledge because there's no one-size-fits-all, one-direction-fits-all. Uh, so options, at least in the second line, are higher relapse. You can use daratumumab, Filzumab, elotuzumab. Um, if those haven't been tried, you can use pomalidomide and dexamethasone. You could use selinexor, bortezomib, belantamab, and then BCMA-targeted therapies, which are indicated in the third or fourth line, could also be used as an investigational agent. So what are some of the top considerations when selecting treatments for your relapse refractory multiple myeloma patients with multiple lines of prior therapy? Like when you're making these decisions, Paula, what do you prioritize in determining which patients would be best suited for one of these therapeutics? So I, I think that for sure you need to consider a patient condition, no? so comorbidities, frailty status, age, and, and also um, very importantly, what are the treatments the patient has previously received? If there was any, let's say, a, a treatment toxicity that prevents you from using the drug in a new line of therapy. But I think that today, one of the, the most important factors to consider is the refractoriness to prior drugs. I think from a practical perspective, when you face a patient in third or fourth line myeloma, uh, probably the treatments the patient has previously received and the drugs to the disease is refractory to are what is really driven your treatment decisions. And Adrian, do you have any other um, sort of considerations that you keep in mind when you're considering your patients for a BCMA-targeted therapy? So, yes, I agree with Paula. There are a lot of considerations for treating relapse refractory multiple myeloma patients, and they include both disease-related factors, patient-related factors, and treatment-related factors, and all of these will influence your, your decisions. Speaking specifically about cytogenetic risk classifications in myeloma, we know that about 25% of myeloma patients have a poor risk cytogenetic um, Profile And the poor risk cytogenetics that we're talking about include the translocation between the chromosomes 4 and 14, uh, translocation 1416, translocation 1420, the deletion of 17P or a gain of 1Q by FISH. So again, that's about a quarter of myeloma patients. And these mutations and this pattern tells us that these patients are going to have 
uh, a poor prognosis. Yeah, I think that also uh, because we are incorporating a lot of new drugs and we have patients that are now uh, responding better with deep responses to the therapies that we have now available, there is a lot of development uh, in the field of prognosis markers, treatment monitoring, and we have now several strategies. We can monitor a minimal residual disease in the marrow as well in the peripheral blood. We can also evaluate a circulating serum BCMA levels, uh, and, and we have now a lot of knowledge with these uh, uh, techniques. So we are uh, extremely happy to have Bruno Paiva uh, join us to share uh, his insights on prognostic markers, risk factors, and treatment sequencing for PCMA therapy. Welcome, uh, Bruno. Can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Thank you so much, Paula. It is my great pleasure to be here. I'm Bruno Paiva, Director of Flow Cytometry in the University of Navarra, Pamplona, Spain. So recently, uh, the use of uh, minimal or measurable uh, residual disease uh, MRD status uh, is being applied in some centers as part of the routine clinical practice and, and very importantly, in the context of clinical trials. Uh, and we know that achieving MRD negativity is one of the most important prognostic uh, factors uh, in myeloma because it is associated with uh, better uh, outcomes. So can you explain us what, what is measurable residual disease and how is it being used as a prognostic marker in, in myeloma? Yes, it would be my pleasure. The classical definition of minimal or measurable residual disease, MRD, is the amount of tumor burden that remains after or throughout treatment that is undetectable using uh, conventional methods available in routine diagnostic laboratories. And this residual disease can be detected using more sensitive methods. So this being the classical definition, if you wish, I prefer to use other, perhaps more uh, dramatic words. That is the fact that providing that nowadays in myeloma, there are so many different and highly effective drugs really monitoring MRD is about the most sensitive and specific evaluation of treatment efficacy. And I would even say that in this particular disease, myeloma, the methods to evaluate MRD are at the very forefront when compared to other hematological malignancies. Therefore, this is the power of MRD to evaluate to the best of our ability, the efficacy of the new and highly effective therapies available to treat patients with multiple myeloma. But on the other side, and I think this is the side that is more important from a clinical point of view, the detection of MRD may help you to resolve the variability, the heterogeneity among patients achieving complete remission those that will not sustain that remission and those that will achieve a longer remission. And usually this is related to detectable or undetectable levels of MRD. So Bruno, you answered a lot of my questions about how MRD can be used in relapse refractory and multiple myeloma in terms of treatment selection, but can you comment a little bit more about how MRD can be applied to predict response to BCMA targeted therapies? In my opinion, in the relapsed refractory setting, because of the more ag aggressive nature of myeloma cells at that stage, I think that generally speaking, perhaps in 90% of the patients, the only way to really achieve a long progression-free survival or time to the next therapy is through the achievement of an undetectable, sustained MRD negative status. As we are seeing that in patients that are otherwise in remission, but continue to show MRD, after different types of treatment for relapsed refractory myeloma, time to relapse and eventually a new line of therapy is very, very short. Now, I would not like to 
overreach what is the value of negative MRD in this setting that unfortunately, in my opinion, is somehow less than in the newly diagnosed setting. In other words, the progression-free survival may not be as long as we see in the newly diagnosed setting. This being said, to really achieve long progression-free survival, I do believe that a negative MRD status will be paramount, at least in 85-90% of patients. And fortunately, there are new regimens that achieve this outcome in a considerable fraction of patients. What would you say are some of the limitations to MRD evaluation in the relapse refractory multiple myeloma setting? In my opinion, the main limitation is the amount of disease spreading at the time of a fourth, fifth, sixth line of therapy. And therefore, if we consider MRD, this will be informative as a more sensitive tool when compared to the criteria for CR, but might be underpowered because of greater disease dissemination. I wanted to just follow up on a limitation that I think I'm also hearing is that currently is the MRD assessment being done on bone marrow? My patients, you know, don't want to have bone marrow biopsies all the time. So I would say that could also be a limitation. So Bruno, if I may, because I think that one of the limitations of MRD is that it's not widely adopted, let's say. Yeah. So yeah. it's we, we have heard a lot. Yeah, we have heard a lot. There is a lot of prognostic implications. And I will say that in newly diagnosed, we are all much um, in favor of willing to do MRD testing or sequencing, you know, MRD samples to, to search for sustained MRD. But in the relapsed refractory setting, with the drugs that we are typically using now, it's of less value because a, a small proportion of patients do get to these very deep responses. But for sure, using this new PCMA targeted therapies by specific antibodies and CAR Ts particularly, that we have seen patients achieving really deep responses, including MRD. And, and you have also shown data showing that a patients that, for example, after CAR T cell therapy that are MRD negative at month three, for example, after CAR T cell infusion, are the patients that are doing better in compared to patients that remain MRD positive at one month after infusion. So really, you know, maybe uh, highlighting that these, these tools may be of greater use in this field, you know, of new therapies where patients are really reaching to these uh, 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 deep responses. So just one question, Bruno, what would you say um, is the knowledge gap or the sensitivity of the assays that needs to be um, addressed in order for MRD to start helping us guide treatment decisions or be more prognostic either in the early stage of treatment or in the relapse refractory setting? I would put it this way. A positive result is equally valuable in one setting and the other. But back to your question, the gap, mm -hmm. I think that in terms of the robustness of methods, we right. are there. For sure, there will be improvement. Yeah. And I would say that the gap is more about the time we need to learn from ongoing clinical trials that have used MRD as either a randomization mm -hmm. or a stratification factor prior different duration or intensity of treatment. I agree. And I think that also in the setting of PCMA treatments, and I will say particularly in the, in the setting of biospecifics that are now planned until this is progression, we will keep on learning how to tailor the duration of therapy, probably based on patients achieving MRD negativity. And maybe we can afford some long-term toxicities in those patients if we are able to show that they can just stop therapy because the, the, the responses will be maintained because of the, of the MRD negativity status. So I think that there is a, a for sure a lot of, of, of things to learn about how to better incorporate the MRD in our real world daily clinical basis to fine tune, as you mentioned, the, the therapies in our patients. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Bruno, Dr. Paiva, for the excellent discussion. 
uh, and uh, thank you very much, Bruno, to, for, for being here with us today. Thank you. This was a very insightful discussion. I really enjoyed. Thank you again for having me. So now we, we wanted to speak a little bit more about sequencing the different PCMA therapies in patients with, with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. So Adrian, what is your, your uptakes of the role of the PCMA therapies and how can we eventually sequence these treatment modalities? Thanks, Paula. There was an interesting abstract presented this past year at ASH uh, by uh, Mehmet Zeda and his colleagues who did a retrospective review at the University of uh, Kansas of their penta-refractory uh, myeloma patients. Um, and by penta-refractory, it means they've had two different imids, they've had two different proteasome inhibitors, they've had an anti-CD38 uh, monoclonal, um, and historically, these patients have a, a poor median overall survival. Um, so he looked at patients um, who went on to receive BCMA-directed therapy that could have been belantamab or CAR-T or a BCMA monoclonal or a bispecific. Of 78 patients, 43 went on to receive BCMA-directed therapy, and uh, 35 did not receive BCMA-directed therapy. And in their retrospective analysis, at least their Kaplan-Meier curve showed that the median overall survival for those BCMA-exposed even when they were uh, penta relapse refractory myeloma, was 17 months. And this is compared to just six months in those patients who did not receive a BCMA-directed therapy. Um, so again, retrospective, but very interesting. And these patients can continue to be treated and achieve uh, long-term survivals. Adrian, that was really exciting data that you shared at ASH on the response uh, to BCMA-targeted therapies in pentarefractory multiple myeloma patients. I do want to just take a moment as well to talk about some of the emerging treatments that are being investigated after either multiple lines of therapy or BCMA-targeted therapy. So a few of those new and emerging therapies that are being investigated include L-rantamab, Livoseltamab, Alnuctamab, and Zyversel. It's important to note that the median prior lines of treatment and patients who've been treated with these um, therapies on trial range from four to six prior lines of therapy. And notably, L-rantamab is the only one of these new therapies that has included patients who received BCMA-targeted therapy. From the reported data among 13 patients with prior BCMA-directed therapy, 54% of those patients who received one of these BCMA-targeted therapies, so 7 out of 13 of those patients, achieved a response, including 46% of them with a VGPR or better. So that's really exciting and encouraging to suggest that patients may be able to receive a BCMA therapy um, and then if they relapse, a subsequent one. So that's really exciting data. Patients um, who were treated on the pivotal studies, including CARTITUDE, uh, CARTITUDE-1, KARMA, and Majestic-1 trials, aside from Majestic Cohort C, none of those patients on those pivotal studies received prior BCMA-directed therapy either. Now thinking about some of these new and emerging therapies, as well as uh, the patients who were included on the pivotal studies, what are some of the remaining questions regarding the use of BCMA targeted therapies in treatment sequencing, Paula? And what do you hope to see in the future? So, so I think that one important uh, aspect to consider when we are thinking about sequencing the different BCMA therapies is that we need to move a little bit away for the classic, you know, patient relapsing on immunomodulatory drugs, changing to proteasome inhibitors and the other way, way around, because these are all drugs targeting the same uh, molecule in the surface of the myeloma cell. So these are all BCMA targeting drugs, but the mechanism of action is completely different. So we're speaking about this possibility of sequencing between these different ages. So it is sure that the data uh, that we have today is still uh, scanty. So uh, as you mentioned before, we have some data uh, uh, with eticlistamab, after prior BCMA antibody drug conjugates or BCMA CAR-Ts. And we have a see that 52% of the patients treated with teclistamab after failing BCMA uh, therapies are able to achieve an objective response. 
and a median duration of response uh, has not yet been reached in this cohort C from the Majestic One with a median follow-up that is close to one year. So suggesting this sensitivity to other BCMA modalities. We also have data with a CELTA cell and, and we uh, do see responses after a antibody drug conjugates or by specific antibodies. But I will make here a note, I think that if you have a patient that is candidate for a BCMA CAR T, you have the slot available and your patient is in good condition, probably it's interesting to do CAR T cell first mm -hmm. and then using the other drugs eventually later because we have seen responses, but the overall response rate and the progression for survival is shorter if we use car after by specific antibodies or antibody drug conjugates than probably the other way around. That may speak about a lower target expression or other, you know, T cell fitness or other right. issues, but we can take this conclusion, although the, the data is still preliminary. So I think that in the future, we need to see more data, more patients treated uh, uh, with different BCMA therapies. I am sure that the real world use of all these drugs will help us guide in what is the best sequence. Uh, and, and, and I think that this is, uh, this is very relevant uh, uh, if we want to uh, use uh, these drugs in a better way. Yeah, I think you raised some really important points in terms of the mechanisms of relapse after each of these therapies, these BCMA targeted therapies may be unique, as you touched on antigen density, T cell fitness. And so um, ongoing studies will hopefully help to clarify what are those mechanisms of disease relapse or antigen escape for each of these. Um, you know, also thinking about what are the best practices for sequencing and assessing responses to direct uh, BCMA-directed therapies. Uh, do you have any thoughts about those best practices, Adrian? You know, I, I agree with what's been said, you know, that we need more data. A lot of what we have is, is preliminary, but I was really fascinated by Bruno's uh, discussion of MRD testing, and I, I'm very hopeful for that in the future to have perhaps be able to guide our treatment selections and, and hopefully, you know, tell us how to use BCMA-directed therapies in the most ideal way. So perhaps now we can talk about patient-centered approach to um, how we treat these relapsed refractory multiple myeloma patients. Do you want to share some of those insights with us, Paula? Yeah, so I think that there is a lot of um, focus now to incorporate the, you know, the patient expectations also in the choice of therapy. And there has been a, a very uh, interesting uh, paper uh, recently published uh, evaluating uh, treatment preferences uh, of patients uh, with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma across different countries regarding patients' preferences for sure efficacy in terms of overall response rate was one of the uh, first factors that patients consider when deciding about therapy Overall survival was also a very important, but other aspects such as duration of response, a incidence of a severe adverse events are all a, a, a considered by the patients as a, a, a factors that will influence their decision. So I think that knowing this, I think that we, we need to educate our patients. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to think of every patient as an individual, um, and you have to meet them where they are. Um, so certainly, they're, they have different levels of health literacy, they have different goals and expectations, they have different support uh, to get them through their therapies. So I think really customizing your decision making to the individual in front of you is paramount. Yeah, I definitely agree with Adrian. seeing the whole patient, what their objectives are, what their goals are, and really having a transparent discussion as to um, the efficacy, but also, like you mentioned, the side effect profile, what's expected of them in terms of the frequency of visits. So another aspect of patient-centered care, and I think in terms of having a healthcare system and treatment of patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma that's representative of the various populations we serve, we touched on in prior episodes about disparities. Adrian, do you want to speak a little bit to some of the health disparities in vulnerable populations that we encounter as we're treating um, patients with multiple myeloma? 
Sure. I think, you know, first of all, the three of us work at academic centers. So we're seeing patients that can get to us. They have the transportation, they have um, the referral patterns in place to see, you know, specialists in myeloma instead of a general hematologist, oncologist that might see all types of malignancies. So, you know, my goal is to try and reach them, whether it's through networking with community physicians uh, giving talks or discussions, uh, increasing education and awareness about myeloma, going to churches, going to beauty salons, um, going to um, you know local social meetings to really just raise awareness about the disease and the different treatment options. Yeah, and I think also, if I may, uh, I think that particularly for older patients or patients with severe comorbidities, uh, we need to work for, uh, you know, a primary care physicians or, you know, internal medicines or geriatric doctors to really work along all other things that may happen. So to good, a good control of hypertension, diabetes, if uh, any other problems, polypharmacy, because sometimes, you know, we just care about myeloma, adding the drugs to treat myeloma, and we have little uh, you know, mm, no, at least myself, you know, to control the other drugs that are, uh, that the patient is taking. And I think that this is sometimes one of the problems when we get these old patients with a lot of drugs ongoing already that you add the myeloma drug, you add the dexamethasone, and then the, you have the infection, you have the mm -hmm. hypertension, you have the cardiac dysfunction going on. And, and then, you know, you need to work with other physicians to really uh, take the patient as a whole, as an individual, as you were mentioning, and to control everything that may happen. And I think that this is also explaining sometimes the poor outcome of these very elderly patients. Yeah, I agree. And I think the only other thing I would say about the vulnerable populations is patients with a lower socioeconomic status. I, I really see this really often that because of the requirement, at least for CAR T-cell therapy, the requirement for a caregiver for that first month after therapy, that we're really impacting our patients who have a lower socioeconomic status because of the impact not only on the patient, but that caregiver who needs to have their work interrupted. Not everyone has paid time off of work. So I'm not sure what the solution is, but sitting down and coming up with creative strategies so that we're not limiting access to patients just because they can't afford to have someone take care of them around the clock for that next month um, is something that we as a, a field need to work to address. Yeah, I think that you you raise a very important point, and I would like to echo that because, you know, in, in Spain also, you know, there is very very limited number of centers that can provide CAR T. That some a lot of patients need to move from their uh, city to other cities far away, and they will need to bring someone of the family with them. Uh, so, and as you mentioned, not everyone uh, can do this, and this is uh, now limiting the access to these very powerful therapies. And I think that yes, as you mentioned, we need to somehow uh, invent something, you know, to, to, to really make these drugs available to, to the larger majority of patients in need. Mm -hmm. So as we start to wrap up, I would like to end on what we'd like to see in a perfect world, given the informative conversation that we've had today. We've touched on several topics, but um, Paula, I'd love to hear what you'd like to see in a perfect world. So in a perfect world, and I will just uh, take one, you know, one of the topics that we have discussed today, I would like to see um, minimal residual disease tools, whether it's mass spec or flow cytometry, really helping us to guide uh, the treatment of our patients and personalize this treatment to improve the, the outcomes. It, this will be my hope uh, for that. You know, in a perfect world, as someone who works in, in stem cell transplant and cellular therapy at a highly specialized center, I feel like I'm getting familiarity with how to give these very uh, challenging treatments. And I think in a perfect world, uh, I'd like to continue to get familiarity and experience and be able to extend these uh, highly technical treatments 
into communities uh, where perhaps they don't need to, this is just my opinion, they, they always need to be given by a specialist in cellular therapy, but perhaps not at my academic center. It can be given closer to the patient. How about you, Melody? Would you like in a perfect world? Yeah, I would go along the lines of what you said, Adrian. You know, we are representing providers in the U.S. and also in Spain. And I think there are probably similar issues to what we've discussed in terms of the special populations around the world. And so in a perfect world, I would like to see some type of international initiative that can help to come up with solutions um, that we may be able to employ to address some of the populations and groups of patients that are not receiving these new BCMA-targeted therapies, um, ways that we can come up with um, solutions and potentially even uh, intersect with uh, various pharmaceutical companies to see if there's ways that we can really balance the playing field or the access of care for these therapies for patients. So on that note, I just want to thank Dr. Rodriguez Otero and Dr. Adrian Phillips for participating in today's MedTable Talk, as well as this MedTable Talk series for these three episodes along with me. There are several resources that our audience can download from the activities website. If you have not, please go ahead and check out episodes one and two from this series. We hope you learned a lot and to get credit for this activity, please complete the post-test and evaluation.